righteous and worthy of all the praise that we can ever give you. I pray this morning that as Ryan comes, we would be captivated by your word, that nothing would distract from what you have to say. As we come together, let us adore you like we open this morning. Adore you and love you for who you are. And head right out the door when they graduate and don't come back. 
And so we started looking deeper into, well, what are the 10% doing that the 90% are, and how do we change that? And for a long time, the way we looked at it, I think we looked at it too simplistically, was, well, those 10% are serving, so let's get these kids something to do. Here's a wash rag, go wash something. Go say hi to people in the parking lot, go put some cones out. I'm not knocking any of those jobs in church. Here's what I'm saying. If there's not a heart to serve, and we hand somebody an area of service, they're going to put it down and walk away. So we, we, what is the difference then in those 10%? I think, I think, and this is what scripture has led me to, to believe. In, in, in my, my experience and where my prayer life is and what scripture has led me to believe. Is the difference between those 10% and the other 90% is not that they're serving. It's that they have a faith that has its own legs. They have a faith that stands on its own. I don't think that is a, a check mark just for a high school student. I think that's for you and me as well. To check, does my faith really belong to me? And, and that's what your, the blank sheet on the, on the back of the thing will say uh, that we're starting in this morning. Um, making your faith your own. Some ideas here to, to find out. Some questions we can ask ourselves. Uh, and this is the simplest way I know how to explain it. But if the only time you open your Bible is when someone stands in front of a group of people and says, turn to the book of, your faith may not belong to you quite yet. Or it may have been yours, but it's not that. I'm not saying you're not saved. I'm saying your faith, that, that, that gift of God, it's the gift of God our faith is, you've stepped away. Faith is like a muscle. You've got to work it out every day, otherwise it gets flat. Anybody ever been in better shape than they're in right now? <laughs> I used, to, I used to, to do ballet at Central Baptist. You guys have seen those guys out there jogging. I dropped 60 pounds, 70 pounds in six months. It was a dramatic weight loss, and uh, I hated the first two weeks. Whew, those, were, those were bad. But I was in good shape. I could run. And the way I knew I was in shape, it's weird how you figure it out. I knew I was in shape when I could run and not think about it. Those of you that have gotten in shape know what I'm talking about. When you're running and, and it's terrible, you're like, I hate this. I don't want to do this anymore. And when you just when you find yourself lost in thought in mid-stride, you're like, oh, hey, I'm in shape. This is cool. Not anymore. It didn't end. No, 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 no. Uh, food and other jobs have moved me on. A desk job will wreck you on it, everybody. Right. Yeah. We got we to gotta get a move. Okay, I'm not getting on that. Um, I am definitely not preaching on getting in shape. <laughs> not around this holiday. Um, ADD's a wonderful thing. We took, we took a turn around. I don't even know where we were. Um, this idea of making our faith our own. If the only time you open your Bible is when somebody says, turn to the book of, yours may not belong to you yet. If the only time you pray is when someone stands in front of a group and says, let us pray, you may have set your faith down. You may have handed it off to somebody. The way I describe it to our students is you are being spoon-fed your faith right now. And that's not a bad thing. We're trying to trying to get something that catches, but at some point you need to take hold of what you believe, why you believe it, and let it do something through life. Let God work. If your faith is not causing an opportunity for God to work in your life, you may not own it right now. It may not be yours. But praise God, He's not done with it yet, is He? And so we can always come back. We can always pick it up. We can start working out. But for those of us that have gotten in shape later, we know that getting back in shape is always worse than getting in staying in shape in the first place. It's rough. Um, let's take a look. Um, we, we're going to pick through the first three chapters of James. We're not going to read the first three chapters of James. I saw some of you hear that and think we're going to be here until Thursday. We're going to pick a few places out of James. And these were the, the major points we hit. As we, were, as we were studying through James with, with the high school and middle school students. So for you guys, refresh your course. All right, here we go. Um, in the book of James, we'll, we'll get there in a second. When we set our faith aside, when our faith doesn't belong to us, but we're trying to live this Christian life, and we're supposed to be more mature than we are, we tend to make rookie mistakes. Um, we tend to get entrapped. I was entrapped just this morning by the lady Sunday school class. <laughs> I was walking past, and I see Amy reaching for the door, trying to shut it from her chair, and she can't quite reach. And she says, hey, can you shut the door? And I said, yes, no problem. I only saw Amy. And now I'm leaning in to shut the door, and I see Catherine teaching. She goes, what, was I too loud for you? And then all these eyes just turn my direction. How dare you? Whoa. <laughs> Pump your brakes, ladies. I'm just trying to help somebody shut the door. We've been, we've been in that situation now. In marriage, it looks a lot like, well, it sounds a lot like, 
Do you think she's pretty? Let me, let me save your life ahead of time, you guys. Take notes here, okay? When she asks, do you think she's pretty? Don't look. Your head doesn't move. It stays right where it is. You got it? Head stays. Do you think she's pretty? Well, babe, is you're my standard of beauty, sweetheart. Obviously not. Who are we talking about? I just saved your life. Take notes. Okay? When she comes out of the dressing room, does this make my back end look big? Don't look. <laughs> You look gorgeous, sweetheart. Look her dead in the eyes. Do not look down. Eye contact. Keep it. These rookie mistakes are what we tend to fall into in our, in our faith when, when our faith doesn't belong to us. And so we start following the stuff that we, we knew years ago we thought we had beat. Or this besetting sin that we thought wasn't a big deal anymore pops back up. It may be because we're not taking care of the basic things that we're supposed to hang on to. So we take a look. At the steps to owning our faith, and they're found through the book of James. I just pulled out three. Let me encourage you. If you're looking for a book to study in the Bible and you don't know where to start, go to James. It's so deep. God's word is so deep in all places, but, but James is so chock full of just good advice to, to get you started, to get you going, to jumpstart this faith you may have set aside. I'm pulling out three things. I could have pulled out 20 from the book of James. I'm simply just grabbing some of our bigger ideas here. But that first blank on your sheet, it's going to say plant your feet in faith. Plant your feet in faith is our first point this morning. It comes out of James chapter 1, verses 2 through 8. And he says, consider it a great joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you experience various trials, because you know that the testing of your faith produces endurance. And let endurance have its full effect so that you may be mature and complete, lacking nothing. Now, if any of you lacks wisdom, he should ask God, who gives to all generously and ungrudgingly, and it will be given to him. But let him ask in faith without doubt. We're going to come back to that verse. For the doubter is like the surging sea driven and tossed by the wind. That person should not expect to receive anything from the Lord, being double-minded and unstable in all his ways. Being the double-minded man. Double-minded in what are the two things we're double-minded in? We've got faith. And the opposite of faith is death. And we find ourselves planted and rooted in one of the two. This is going to boom up on a lot of the speaker. I apologize. I'm going to Good. Jason, pick on you again. Faith and death. So let's say we're talking about the difference between faith and death. Right, stand just on that side for me. Thanks, man. I'm going to give you a little show. All right. We're friends, right? We're good? Okay, we're going to be okay after this? Just a little shot, nothing big. Small shot. No big deal. He withstood it. He's going to live. Is your mom in here? No. no. Okay. I just showed him her. Yeah. All right. Do me a favor. Put one foot on the chair. I'm going to give you the same shot, okay? Not as easy, right? You, you made it look easy because you, you try to look tough. I get it. Rachel, look away. Doesn't have to look tough on your <laughs> It's harder to do that. Thank you very much. Give Jason a hand. I appreciate it. <laughs> the difference in faith and doubt, and the difference in the double-minded man versus the single-minded person standing in their faith, is where are we planted? Are we planted in faith, in a solid place where should, with sure footing, so that when wind and waves, as the Bible always calls them, the things of the world are going to throw at us, come along, we take a little knock, but we're okay. But when we start to put our 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 basis. Have everything we're doing, instead of in faith, but we put a little bit in doubt. When that same amount of wind and waves comes, we get knocked a little harder. And I don't know if any of you have ever tried to change a light bulb while standing on top of a chair. It's terrifying. Mm -hmm. <laughs> now imagine that. It is the idea that you've, you've taken yourself completely away from faith. I'm, I'm putting in faith that I'm not going to fall this chair in front of all of you. And now I'm in a place of complete doubt. I've walked away from what I know to be true, and I've stopped leaning on God and all the little things, especially in the big things. And I've put everything I've got in doubt. <coughs> and now, and I didn't mean to, and I didn't even realize it happened. And it wasn't like I specifically set out to move away from God because I didn't trust Him, but all sin is based in a lack of trust. Now my feet are firmly planted in doubt, and when something comes my way, I've got a much larger fault. Double-mindedness. Double-mindedness means that we're, we're standing here. We think we're doing okay because we've got one foot in. I'm going to church. I'm reading the Bible while I'm there. 
I'm trying to use what I've got there. I'm even serving. But we still have one foot in doubt. I've never shared my faith. When trouble comes along, the first thing I do is complain rather than keep my knees on prayer. We're living that double, that double-mindedness. And the double-mindedness makes us unsta unstable in every possible way. Faith and doubt. Uh, he'll let James will later on talk uh, in, in, in that book about, the, about what we put in versus what comes out. The garbage in, garbage out principle. That, that, that whatever we put in is what's going to produce. And he uses agriculture to describe it. That whatever we're selling, we're going to reap. Faith and doubt is like filling a well full of water and gasoline. If you're trying to live a little bit in both, you're going to draw up out of yourself a mixture of the two, and water mixed with, mixed with gasoline is good for nothing. You can't run a car on it. You can't drink it. It's a, it, it's a, it's, it is just a, it's just a substance that you can't do anything with. And if you're producing something that, that comes from both faith and doubt into your life, it is an unblessable existence. It says that God wants to bless us, those of us who stand in faith with everything we have. We've not compartmentalized. We've not put anything, any hope anywhere else. We're putting it all in Him and we're acting in faith. Not just living in faith. We can say what we believe all day long. We're acting in faith. He'll bless it. But if we're acting partially in faith and partially in doubt, He says He won't. And that's not me. That comes out of James chapter 1. So, plant your feet in faith. Pray in faith. Act in faith. Talk in faith. When you pray, some of us feel like our prayers aren't going past the ceiling. We've got to pray in faith because it's not about what we're praying. It's about who we're praying to. He's proven himself faithful. He'll prove himself faithful again. It doesn't matter what you've got to bring him. It's just that you bring it to him. Act in faith. Are we, are we and we'll talk about that here in a second, but acting in faith, uh, when we make a move in our life, do we make the move and then pray afterward, Lord, I hope that was the right decision. I've done it. I ended up in a job I didn't like. I hated that. the worst job I've ever had. Because I made a move in my life without checking with the Lord. And we do that sometimes. We make a move and we're like, oh, oh, oh I forgot to pray. I pray. Pray it up. Pray it up. Okay, I'm good, right? Nope. This is not my fault. And then talk in faith. The idea that when you feel yourself coming up on a major complaint, that's doubt speaking. And doubt is where sin is born. So we've got to learn to talk in faith. Let's, let's, let's run on to, to chapter 2. So, plant your feet in faith. And the second one on your, on your blank sheet there, put your hands and feet to work. So it's not just, it's planting it in faith. So I'm saying plant your feet and then put your feet to work. What, what, which are we supposed to do? It's both. If you've ever seen a, run, a runner run a race, they plant their the foot placement at the start of the race is, is incredibly important. They plant their feet on shore footing before they start running the race. So we get it, we get to a place where we're, we're safe and secure in, in the Lord, and that's where our faith is based in, and then we take off. Put your hands and feet to work. Chapter 2, verses 14 through 18, he, he, he moves on. He talks a little bit about the set of favoritism that had, they had trouble in the church at that time. These rich people were coming in. And, um, and they were wanting to give more favor to the rich man sitting in on the pew and telling the poor person here, you can, you can sit on the floor. And he says, this isn't the way it's supposed to go. It's, it, you're supposed to treat everyone with the same way, that, well, the way that God treated them. Someone's worth is wrapped up in what someone's willing to pay for them and Jesus paid it all. And so their worth is exactly the same no matter what their earthly worth may seem to be. We're looking at, at, at what they, their worth as a person. And then he comes down to this idea in verse 14, what good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith but does not have works? Can such faith save him? If a brother or sister is without clothes and lacks daily food, and one of you says to them, go in peace, stay warm, and be well fed, but you don't give them what the body needs, what good is it? In the same way, if it doesn't have works, it is dead by itself. Skip down. He, he gives the example of Abraham's faith. And how it produced works when he was asked to do something unthinkable. And Rahab's faith when it produced works when she was asked to do something incredibly dangerous. And then he comes down to this, this conclusion um, to, to what he's talking about. Verse 26, he says, For just as the body without the spirit is dead, so also faith without works 
is dead. He's not saying you're not saved. He's saying you're, 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 you're dead in the water. You're not moving. I'd like to ask a painful question this morning. How many of you have lost someone you love? That's most of us. Most of us have lost someone we love, someone we're, we're close to. We go to that funeral. And maybe it's an open casket. And for those of us that have experienced that, we know that when we go and we see a loved one laying in that casket, they don't quite look the same, do they? There's something not there. The essence of who they are, what made them who they were to you, isn't there anymore. It always makes them look just, just not quite right. And the, and the mortician can do an amazing job, but the, there's something missing. That's what our faith looks like to a world outside the church. When we say we believe in Jesus, and we say we believe in compassion and love and kindness and reaching out to the world in, in, in the name of Jesus, but we don't do it. We look not quite right. There's something off about a group of people who says they follow this Jesus but act nothing like him. And so we look dead. Our faith looks dead. It is dead. It can be revived, but here's the, here's the truth of the matter. You and I can't revive it. Right? Uh, they don't just look like that. If, you pop, if you'll pardon me for just a moment, I just realized I stepped up here with uh, <coughs> kind of my need for my next illustration. Tyler, would you care to run back to the printer? Just grab me a piece of paper. That's all I need. I meant to grab that before I got up here. <coughs> Appreciate it. Point number three. So we've planted our feet in faith. We've put our hands and feet to work. Here may be the toughest one any of us have to face or have to do or have to deal with. This is going to be rough. Put your tongue in check. Anybody ever said something they regretted saying? Mm -hmm. Ooh. Was it today? Some of hands went up pretty fast. <laughs> Ooh, shit. Uh, how many of you ever had something regret regrettable said to you? No, I mean, really? Okay. <laughs> Anybody had somebody say something harsh to you before? So we've been on both ends of it, right? You said something that you really wish you could have taken back. Like you, you wished beyond all hope that the words that came out of your mouth could be grabbed back out of the air and showed back in. Everybody could just forget that they existed. Um, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. When we're talking about mistakes in marriage, that's a, that's a big one. What did I ever do that? It was just a sock. Like, you know, we, we've all had those moments. Some of you laughing, some of you laughed there because you're like, I had that moment yesterday. Um, thank you very much, appreciate it. Um, what if? And I found this, uh, we, we had a brief foray into what parenting is like. And for those of you that are, that are, that are experiencing it for the long haul, I feel for you. Woo! Buddy. Um, we had a foster kid with us. Actually, a lot of you know her. We had her from, from about 13 to 16. When she was with us. You know, for fun years. And um, I discovered something that I never had before. When, you have, when you're in a position to have someone saying something terrible to you. And you don't care about the words that are coming out of their mouth near as much as you feel for how bad they're going to regret those words later. You care more about the person and how they're going to feel later than what they're saying. Does that make sense? How much so does God experience that with us on a regular basis? With the words we say, and not just what we say, but how we say it. To each other, to a lost and dying one who doesn't know him yet, and sometimes to him. He's not hurt by our words. We can't hurt God. But he is hurt by how much it's going to hurt us. Our sin harms God in the way that it harms his children and he cares about us. And so when we start talking about the words we say and the way we say them, and let me make sure, let me make sure I'm very clear about this. When, and I had to, and this is not just for the teenagers. This is for everybody. When, we talk, when the Bible talks about the tongue, and what we say is talking about our communication that is not just spoken, that is written, that is posted, that is whatever way we communicate. So social media falls under this too. We have to, we have to apply biblical rules across every, across every, every meeting. So this means everything. So reading that in this light, we take a look at, at chapter 3. And this is where he reserves some of the harshest words in James. He says, Not many should become teachers, my brothers, because you know that we will receive a stricter judgment. 
For we all stumble in many ways. If anyone does not stumble in what he says, he is mature, able also to control the whole body. Now, if we put bits into the mouths of horses so, so that they obey us, we direct their whole bodies. And consider ships. Though very large and driven by fierce winds, they are guided by a very small rudder, wherever the will of the pilot directs. So too, though the tongue is a small part of the body, it boasts great things. Consider how a small fire sets ablaze a large force. And then he starts describing this little muscle that all of us have inside of our head. And what he really, he's not talking specifically about it, he means the way we communicate with the world around us. And the tongue is a fire. And the tongue, a world of unrighteousness or iniquity, depending on what translation you're reading, is placed among our members. It stains the whole body, sets the course of life on fire, and is itself set on fire by hell. Every kind of animal, bird, reptile, or fish is tamed and has been tamed by humankind, but no one can tame the tongue. And here it goes again. It is a restless evil full of deadly poison. With the tongue we bless our Lord and Father, and with it we curse people who are made in God's likeness. Blessing and cursing come out of the same mouth. My brothers and sisters, these things should not be this way. Does a spring pour out sweet water and bitter from the same opening? Can a fig tree produce olives, my brothers and sisters, or a grapevine produce figs? Neither can a salt water spring yield fresh water. It's the double-mindedness principle coming back. All sin is based in doubt. Doubting that God can satisfy. Doubting that God is all we need. And so that's why we turn to other things in our sin. Or we, we, we wield our sin like a sword to the people around us. And this idea of double-mindedness is that blessing and cursing are coming out of our mouth. The blessing comes from somebody whose feet are planted in faith, and cursing comes from somebody who is double-minded or completely planted in death. Only cursing can come from. He says that it, he had some pretty strong words for it. He says the tongue uh, is a small part of the body. Grace was uh, consider how small part sets a place large force. And then he says the tongue is a fire. The tongue, a world of unrighteousness, is placed among our members and stains the whole body, sets the course of life on fire. And this part is interesting. And is itself set on fire by heaven. And I read that part. And when we were studying with the students, I was like, I don't know what he means by this. It's set on fire by hell. And when I looked further into it, normally when we look in the Bible and the word hell comes up, it typically is sheol. It means the grave or the underworld. It was, it was how, it was, it was their word for hell. But in this case, it is the word Gehenna. And Gehenna is actually, um, it, it's, it, in their culture, it was a double meaning for hell, but it was also described um, a valley outside of Jerusalem. Where in the Old Testament, the people who, uh, the pagans who worshipped the fire god would meet there to worship their fire god and set things on fire, presumably. And in their modern times, it was where, it was the city dump for Jerusalem. It was where all their refuse and their awful went, uh, went when they needed to get it away from the city to, to keep clean. Taken in their meaning for what it meant to their people to what it was in their day, he is saying the tongue is set on fire and produces hot garbage. This is the easiest way to, if we're going to translate that into Kentucky speak, you're spewing hot garbage before yourself. You're putting out, you're putting out something that is unpleasant and unnecessary with what you say. Um, when we say something to somebody, it sticks. How many of you can still remember some harsh words you received in your life? That may have been years, decades ago. Yeah? I always go back to a kid named Seth Sight from 10th grade who uh, said something to me so mean that it got straight to all my insecurities about who I am as a person he didn't mean to, and it still sticks. And uh, my wife used to work with him, and every time I'd go to work and see him, we used to go, this was 12, 15 years ago, uh, still. He made fun of my freaking teeth, that wasn't cool. Uh, <laughs> he said, your teeth look like you've been chewing on rocks, and he walked away, and I didn't punch him, and I shouldn't have punched him. Anyway, uh, see, we hang on to stuff like that, right? Some of you can remember some harsh words that have been said to you over the years. They still sting, especially if they came from somebody you love. We try to, we try to forgive and forget and move on. But sometimes when there's one that, that stuck, that we never, maybe we never got a chance to go forgive that person or, or they never apologize and we're letting it stick in there. We're just holding that grudge. But when we say something every time, whether we apologize or not, what we say sticks. When I fold this piece of paper up, it's got a crease in it. I can do everything I can. I can apologize. I can, I can explain where I, what state of mind I was in, when I said it. They can tell me it's okay. They can forgive me. But what I said is still evident in their brain. 
will never go away. Some of us have lived a life where one thing after another, something said, something done, something handed to us, has left another little crease in shape. And sometimes the person walked away without ever caring if that crease got un unfurled or, or made okay. But we're walking around, scarred and beat up. And you and I would have every right to turn around and use what's been used against us to use against somebody else. It's fair. But it's not gracious. God's grace calls us to forget the scars that have been imposed on us and instead Think about the scars that were imposed on our Savior when we're speaking to someone who made these like us. And what's worse than us walking around with these scars we've accumulated over the years is that some of us are putting these on other people. With what we say, with how we say it, and sometimes with what we don't say. God's calling you to talk to people in a way that you understand they were made in this life as he's calling us to communicate with people. And I, got, I don't have to tell you guys that the communication that exists in our world today is not getting any better. We're eating each other alive. The only time the church comes together anymore is when someone says something nasty on Twitter to someone else. And we all want to see what they We get excited. For the big moments. We get excited for the big monumentous things. And I'm preaching myself. I says we let we let ourselves get excited for the celebrity we're going to go see at the conference rather than the fact that we're going to go meet with Jesus. And we get caught up in the wrong stuff. We don't watch what we post and we don't go out of our way to be the person who speaks love and compassion and kindness in the people around us as Jesus would call us to do because we have doubts and we're hanging on to them. I don't know where you're at this morning. I don't know what doubts you're hanging on to. But we've got to recognize those in ourselves. Because every sin we commit is based in some sort of doubt. All. Doubt is, doubt is the breeding ground of sin. Doubt that God can. Doubt that God will. Doubt that God is enough. All of those doubts cause us to sin. How do we walk the walk, which is our works? How do we talk the talk, which is our talk? And this is where I'm going to finish, and if you want to get your regular invitation. <laughs> I put that question at the bottom um, on your fill-in sheet. How do we walk the walk? How do we talk the talk? How do we make what we say we believe match up and what we do with what we believe? How do we plant our feet firmly and get going? How do we... And it's interesting. It's interesting the, the, the place we come to. How do I talk the talk and walk the walk? It's very simple. Be still and listen. Some of us are trying to match up and get our walk matched up with God and get our talk matched up with God when, when what really he's calling us to do is to stop and be quiet. We think we're mature enough in the faith to get this thing back on track. And that means we've gotten to a place, and this is what I do every time. I think I've gotten to a place where I can get things back on track. The Bible never tells me to put my faith back on track. It tells me to go to the one who gave it to me in the first place. And so we get the, this idea of be still and listen. I tried to find one verse to emphasize that conclusion about be, being still and listening. Um, and still I found dozens. Dozens of dozens. Old Testament. New Testament, prophets, psalms, epistles, gospels, history, law, and poetry, all authored by God, all pointing to two simple practices meant to bring us back in sync with the Creator, the Savior, our covenant-keeping God, the one who's worthy of our worship, the one worthy of our best, the one who came down to us, who is faithful, always has been faithful, always will be faithful. He is the righteous one, the author of the story you're living every day. And if you haven't heard this lately, please hear this. 
he's not done writing it yet. He's not done. I don't care if you're 16 or 86. I don't care if you're in the worst place in your life financially you've ever been. You're in the worst job you've ever had. Or if you're on the mountaintop for both. He is still trying to write a story that is bigger than you with your life. He is calling all of us to something greater than this. He is calling us there. And we have set our faith down for a moment to take a breather. And that's fair and that's understandable. But it's not right. We're supposed to cling to that faith with everything we have. We're supposed to cling to him with everything we have. We need only to be still and listen for what we do next. Would you guys have to close your eyes for this morning? <clears throat> Always want to have a time of invitation when we end service. This morning I've talked a lot about where Christians who already have a faith in Jesus are supposed to go and what they're supposed to do. And you're here this morning and you're not there yet. You don't know Jesus as your Savior. You're not a Christian yet. You've not had that moment in time that you can point to where you became His and He became yours. Holy Spirit became part of you and you were saved. If you're here this morning, just as a testimony, you say, I remember that time. I know when that was. Just slip your hand up. Amen. Maybe you're here this morning and you don't you don't have that time. You can't put your finger on it. I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand. I am going to ask you to consider. Could today be the day of salvation? Could it be the, be the day that you come into contact with good works that he ordained in your life before the world exists. Come today and be saved. There'll be several of us standing down the front. Yes, we call for invitation. Two minutes we can give you the info you need to make that decision. We won't make it for you, but it's yours to make. He loves you. He died for you. He wants, he wants the best for you. For the rest of us that raise our hand, we, we have that moment. We are Christians. We name the name of Christ.